Testing one, two, three. Good evening, Bante. Good evening. I know we still don't have internet or TV. This Malka Gane Pola. Oh, yes. From New Jersey. Right. Yeah. So I'm doing from the, my phone. <laughs> oh, from the phone. Is... Phone, yes, Bante. What the uh, electric company hasn't got around to fixing your phone line? Like Verizon, so they say that we have a certain problem, must be something happened outside for the just outside our house. So they are coming only tomorrow. Yes, well, at least you have a phone, <laughs> right. <laughs> Is it raining up This there? topic seems very... Um, it did rain before, but now it stopped. Here, here it's raining a little bit now. Oh, is it really? Oh, yeah, yeah it did rain before. Yeah. What were you going to say about this topic? I was going to say it's very interesting. Yeah, it's a very deep subject. Uh, it is, right? I don't know. I'm trying to, I'm reading and trying to understand. <laughs> It's yeah, hard. This is a deep dhamma. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of superficial dhamma out there. The... Bhante, how are you? Sadhu, sadhu. Yeah, the yeah. missus was just uh, telling me about your... Uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah right. I heard a little bit. Yeah, it's terrible. But, you know... That's the nature, right? <laughs> Bante, yeah. can I ask you something, please? You know, so now when I go for a walk in the morning, I say, I feel the wind. Okay, I, then I feel like uh, the birds chirping. So how do I uh, think of the five aggregates regarding these? Well, first of all, when you're you're hearing, you, you recognize that it's birds, then you can say, ah, that's perception, the aggregate of perception. That means the memory that's stored in your brain, that particular sound vibration pops back up into the consciousness as the memory of a bird. The uh -huh. sound belongs to a bird. That's perception. Right. If it makes you feel nice, a mm -hmm. pleasant feeling, then that is the feeling. Yeah, right. Oh, that's and you're also conscious at the same time. You're aware that you are hearing that sound, but that's uh -huh. conscious. Uh, okay. And if you think about the bird, like, oh, uh, you know, any thoughts about it, that's the mental activity. Okay. And the vibration itself is the form aggregate. The sound vibration itself is the form aggregate. So the form is like. Uh... Sound that you any, hear any any sensory oh. vibration. Even when I touch my skin, I got a feeling there uh -huh. that hardness, oh. the earth element. That's the that's the form aggregate. Okay. And if I feel it's painful, that's the the feeling aggregate. And I recognize that's my arm, the perception aggregate. And I recognize that arm belongs to me, the uh, ego consciousness. So they're all there every time. Thank you, Bhante. Yeah. I'm trying to like put what I learned, like when I walk, good. you have time so that yes. think about this. 
And the whole point of it is to uh, see things, these things are just phenomenon, you know, it's not me that is doing this. It's feeling that feels. I don't feel, feeling feels. I don't perceive, perception perceives. I'm not conscious, consciousness is conscious. Anyway, we we'll, may discuss, look at so many things in this sutta. Right. Thank you very much, Bhante. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste, Bhante. Oh, good evening, Soba. Uh, how, how are you feeling today? Okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm okay, Bhante. Maybe I will be more okay after your program. <laughs> after meditation, yeah, you should be a, a little bit Always a little bit better after meditation. Yes, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> so, Clark, uh, I think Prashant is still. Uh, he may not come on this evening also, I know. Yeah, I think he's still busy with mom. Yeah. I haven't talked with him in a couple of days. But, uh... You talk to him? Uh, no, not in a couple of days. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, friends, uh, uh, please uh, go ahead and uh, mute your uh, mics now. And we're going to, uh, for those who like, recite the uh, Namatasa and the three the refuges. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Saranangachami Dhammang Saranangachami Sangang Saranangachami Dutiyampi Buddhang Saranangachami Dutiyampi Dhammang Saranangachami Jami Duty Ampi Sangang Sarananga Jami Tati Ampi Buddang Sarananga Jami Tati Ampi Dhammang Sarananga Jami Tati Ampi Sangang Sarananga Jami So uh, welcome, friends, to this uh, sutta uh, study tonight. And uh, <clears throat> tonight, the sutta we're going to cover is uh, sutta number uh, 43 in the Majmanikaya. 
the Maha Vedala Sutta, or it's usually translated in English as the uh, greater series of questions and answers. And actually this sutta, uh, as I mentioned as I, in my little uh, note that I sent out uh, last uh, Monday, that uh, <clears throat> this is a conversation between Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Maha Kotika. Uh, both arhants and both very wise uh, monks. Uh, they were, you know, discussing the Dhamma. Of course, the monks in the time of the Buddha or arhants, whenever they get together, that's all they really talk about is the Dhamma because that's what's always in their uh, mind. And it's not like here when people get together, they talk about all kinds of, you know, things. Uh, but uh, it's interesting when uh, what kind of uh, how these arahants uh, you know have their conversation. It's always about the, the dhamma, uh, and it's pretty deep dhamma. So it's not uh, some of it's not easy to understand, especially the the later uh, questions. But uh, you know this is what you would call deep uh, dhamma. In fact, the a analytical Dhamma, and Mahakutika actually was one of the was known for being one of the great uh, uh, expositors of the Dhamma and a, able to uh, explain in uh, details the some of the deeper meanings of the Dhamma. And of course, Sariputta, being the captain of the Dhamma, was always eager to engage. Uh, fellow monks in uh, deep Dhamma discussions. <clears throat> uh, so it kind of starts out fairly uh, questions, you know, fairly easy questions. This is a question that uh, Mahakotika is uh, answering. And uh, Mahakotika was asking these questions to Venerable uh, Sorry, Buddha. So he says, uh, one who is unwise, one who is unwise, it is said, friend. With reference to what is this said, one who is unwise. And Sorry, Buddha replies, one does not wisely understand. That is why it is said, one who is unwise. And then he asks, what doesn't one wisely understand? And the reply is, one does not wisely understand this is suffering. One does not wisely understand this is the origin of suffering. One does not wisely understand this is the cessation of suffering. One does not wisely understand this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. And that is why it is said, one who is unwise. So basically, it's the Four Noble Truths. So according to the Dhamma teachings, one who is unwise <clears throat> doesn't understand the Four Noble Truths. It doesn't mean one doesn't know how to, you know, figure out a algebra, <laughs> a logarithm, or any other complicated mundane knowledge, right? So people might have none mundane knowledge. You know, all these scientists and people like that uh, who are inventing all kinds of things, and they may have mundane knowledge, but uh, they would not necessarily be considered wise uh, from the Dhamma point of, of view if they still don't, uh, you know, know the, the, the truth about suffering. So even though they can go up and explore Mars and send back pictures, they they may still be caught up in uh, you know their own types of problems at home or whatever maybe addictions or you know whatever so they they still uh, you know suffer and then the, he goes on to ask so Mahakotika was uh, delighted in Sariputta's answer and he asked a further question one who is wise one who is wise it is said, 
Well, one wisely understands the Four Noble Truths. I'm not going to repeat all the, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the sentences, but basically he's saying the opposite. One who is wise is understanding suffering, the cause of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the path leading to the cessation of suffering. That is why one is called uh, wise. So, you know, this is all, all per pertaining to uh, the Dhamma and not mundane type of, uh, you know, understandings. <clears throat> and then he goes on to, uh, to ask questions about consciousness. So he said, consciousness, consciousness, it is said. What is this consciousness? And Venerable Sai put replies, it cognizes friend. That's why <clears throat> it is called consciousness. So our consciousness, uh, you know, it's the knowing faculty. So it's that which allows us to have experiences. Otherwise, we basically we would be dead or would be unconscious in a coma. Uh, so it's consciousness which actually experiences, you know, sight, sound, smells, taste, touches, and thoughts. So it, it cognizes them. It's, it's a cog cognition. <clears throat> Although it does say, what does it cognize? It cognizes uh, pleasant, it cognizes painful, or it cognizes neither painful nor pleasant, or it cognizes blue and yellow and, <clears throat> and so on. It cognizes different things. And it also cognizes I am. And then he goes on to ask another question. Wisdom and consciousness, are these states conjoined or disjoined? And it is possible, and is it possible to separate each of these states, wisdom and consciousness, from the other in order to describe the difference between them? So Sariputra replies, wisdom and consciousness, friend, these states are conjoined, not disjoined. And it is impossible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. So, I mean, you can be conscious without having wisdom, but here he is asking specifically about wisdom and consciousness. So, you know, if you cognize something, then, uh, well, well, I'll just say, uh, uh, read what he says. For what one wisely understands, that one, one, one cognizes. What one cognizes, that's what one wisely understands. So when you have experience in meditation, let's say when you cognize, all of a sudden you experience a deep state of tranquility, then you, be, you're, you cognize that. You, you say, oh, the mind is very calm now. Uh, so, you know, that's the, that's the cognition of the state of uh, calmness. If you weren't consciousness, you wouldn't be aware of the state of, con uh, of calmness. Uh, or if you have some insight, if you're getting some insight into uh, anicca dukkha or anatta, then you, you cognize that state of uh, anicca, you cognize uh, that state of, uh, you know, the weakening of the sense of, of self, and you, uh, you understand it. Ah, the sense of self is weaker in me now. Uh, and that's, that's also the wisdom. So again, all these questions are pertaining to uh, the Dhamma. Uh, then he asks, what is the difference, friend, between wisdom and consciousness? The difference, friend, between wisdom and consciousness is the wisdom is to be developed. Consciousness is to be fully understood. So, you know, in the process of our meditation, you know, you know, wisdom is gradually developed. 
That means your understanding of the five aggregates, your understanding of impermanence. So, you know, as time goes on, your understanding has been developing. Uh, and especially when you start to understanding about uh, no self and understanding about how attachment brings suffering and so on. So the, all the, the levels of wisdom, it's a gradual, you know, increase. And uh, <clears throat> the consciousness is to be fully understood. That means to fully understand how uh, the consciousness is not self. That, that this feeling of I that we have is not the owner or the controller of uh, uh, the consciousness or the, the five aggregates. So then he goes on to talk about feelings. <clears throat> feelings, feelings, it is said, friend, with reference to what is feelings said. It feels, friend, that's why it is feeling. What does it feel? It feels pleasure, it feels pain, and it feels neither pain nor pleasure. It feels. That's why it's called uh, feeling. <clears throat> so that's what's interesting. Normally we say, I am feeling. There's no feeling feels it. It's not I am feeling it. Feeling feels it. Consciousness is aware of it. But the idea of a I that I'm doing it is an illusion that's being created in the mind over and over and over. But actually it's, it's the function, the aggregate of feeling and the memory of what you have uh, related to it before. We've developed, you know, we've talked a lot in the past about the aggregates and about feelings, right? So uh, the whole point is that uh, it's feeling, uh, feeling has the function of feeling and it feels pleasure, pain, and neutral. These are the definitions of feeling. Feelings of sadness is not a feeling. Sadness is a mental state. It's, a, it's an emotion. So in, in the Buddhist terminology, uh, in, you know, in a Pali, uh, uh, sadness or happiness wouldn't be uh, classified as a feeling as such. Although, you know, it is, you know, when you're happy, it's pleasurable, right? And when, when you're having pain, it's, it's sad, but it's sadness arises because of the pain. So it's a different, you know, it's an emotion. It's, it's a sankara. Uh, <clears throat> so the whole point in, in this type of discussions is to, to see how, especially the five aggregates are you know, they uh, are what are creating our whole experience of body and mind due to past conditions. And then he goes on to uh, ask about perception. It says, perception, it is said, friend, with what is perception? It perceives. That's why it's called perception. What does it perceive? It perceives blue, it perceives yellow, perceives red, white, and of course everything else. <laughs> it just happens to give these few examples, but it perceives, that's why it's called perception. Now, as we talked about also in last week, there was a question about the perception and consciousness. Really, you can't separate them because whatever you perceive, it's conscious, you, you're conscious of it, but the perception is what creates the mental, is the memory of it. So it's the identification that this is blue as opposed to something else that is red or perceives, uh, uh, you know, my body and, uh, as opposed to some other person's body. All the, basically the memory <coughs> and the name and labels come into the mind whenever our senses are contacted. So it's the perception is basically called memory because it's, it's really, it recreates <laughs> the, the object from the past. 
In other words, you recognize uh, my face because you've seen it before. Many, some of you have seen it many times. But actually, it's just some color and a certain shade. And somebody else wouldn't recognize me who never saw me before. But because you recognize, oh, that's Bhante Rahula, that it's because it's the memory that's recreating. And you identify as a monk, all these perceptions, you know, come in. It's because of the past. Uh, and the, and the, the consciousness is cognizing it, but the actual perception is what is making it into an object that stands out from everything else. In other words, you see the face, you see this face here, but you see the Buddha image uh, in next door. I mean, <laughs> next to me. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> uh, so, you know, the mind is perceiving different uh, uh, things. And you know that I'm not the Buddha image. The Buddha image is not my face. So you know, that's a function, of course, the discrimination and the memory. Uh, consciousness wouldn't do that. Consciousness just is, is conscious of them, but it's, it's the fact of feeling a perception of volitional activities that give the meaning to the, to the object. Otherwise, it wouldn't mean a lot. Okay, so then it says, uh, feeling, perception, and consciousness. Are these states conjoined or not, dis not disjoined? And is it is impossible to separate each of these states from others in order to describe the difference between them? For what one feels, that one perceives, and what one perceives, that what one cognizes. That's why you really can't separate them. They're, these states are conjoined, not disjoined. It is impossible to separate each of these from the others in order to describe the difference. Okay, then he goes on to uh, Uh, next, this next uh, question that he asks, what can be known by purified mind consciousness released from the five faculties? So this is a little bit deep question. Uh, <clears throat> the five faculties, basically he's talking about the sense faculties of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, and the body or the skin. Uh, so when the mind is released from the impact of those five senses, that's what he's, he's getting at. What can be known by purified mind consciousness. And then he says, the, the, <clears throat> what can be known with the purified mind consciousness is the infinite space, infinite consciousness, the base of nothingness, these are the states that can be known by the purified mind consciousness. That means uh, those are the formless jhanas, actually, what, what he's talking about, the formless jhanas. Uh, so the sphere of infinite space, infinite consciousness, the base of nothingness. Uh, because these are not these are beyond the material world. So when you attain the formless jhanas, you, you become not conscious of any uh, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, or uh, you know, any type of worldly feelings. It's beyond, uh, that's why it's called the formless realm. And that can be known by the purified mind consciousness. That means uh, the, the contact with the five senses you know, corrupts and distorts the normal consciousness. That's why it's called the purified mind consciousness that's been disconnected from the worldly uh, contact. And with what does one understand this state? And then the answer is one understands 
that state can be known with the eye of wisdom. So with the eye of wisdom uh, and consciousness, it is consciousness too. You, consciousness, you're conscious of the, the infinite space or infinite uh, consciousness or nothingness. Uh, that's also a kind of perception also. But it's nothing to do with the material world. Uh, that's why it's called formless realms, as opposed, as opposed to the mundane world or even the form world. So the mundane world has all the objects of the five senses because they're fully engaged. And the form world also has uh, the subtle types of, of forms in it, like even seeing a vision of a deva or uh, something like that is a subtle a form, so it's still considered uh, Lokya Dhamma. <clears throat> and then, uh, then he asks, what is the purpose of wisdom? The purpose of wisdom is direct knowledge. Its purpose is full understanding. Its purpose is abandoning. So, you know, wisdom in the Dhamma, when we use the word wisdom, it, it's different than the word wisdom. Even in English, you say, oh, that person's a wise person, but usually it means a lot of mundane understanding, which is good, but it's not uh, wisdom according to uh, the Dhamma. Uh, because again, wisdom, it's understanding the Four Noble Truths. And understanding the Four Noble Truths it only happens when you attain stream entry, when you understand it fully. And that is the super mundane path already. Because you know, have to remember these two guys, the Sariputta and Maha Kotika, Kotika uh, they're both arahants, you know, and their mind are all the time in this, uh, in this state of uh, wisdom. I mean, you can imagine these guys having a discussion like this in, in Walmart or in Safeway or something. You know, people will be walking by and hear something and think these guys are from Mars or something, you know. They wouldn't understand nothing. <clears throat> then he goes on to ask about uh, the right view. How many conditions are there for the rising of right view? Friend, there are two conditions for the arising of right to view, the voice of another and wise attention. This is very interesting, okay? So right view means, of course, the view of the Four Noble Truths. That's the definition of right view, understanding suffering, the cause of suffering, the cessation of suffering, the path leading to the cessation of suffering. So he's saying, <coughs> The two conditions for the rising are right, the voice of another, or it could be a book. Because none of us knew anything about the Four Noble Truths until either you read it in a book, or even in Sri Lanka, you'd have gone to the temple and you learned it from monks, or the parents would have told you, or you read it in a book, unless you were already a a sotapanna or a once returner, it might have come spontaneously, spontaneously to you from a past life, but uh, for most people, it's going to be, uh, and then you have to wise attention because, you know, I can, in, you know, somebody could be talking about the Four Noble Truths and somebody is kind of just, you know, nodding in and out and wouldn't have understood nothing or hardly nothing. At the end of talk, say, what did you say? So there was no wise attention there. Uh, and so that's why hearing and wise attention, because you can hear, but if you don't have wise attention, you're not going to understand it. That's why it's the wise attention is important. Uh, and then it says, friend, how many factors is right view assisted? when it has deliverance of mind for its fruit, deliverance of mind for its benefit. That means when one has attained uh, Magga and Pala, the stages of like 
uh, entering the stream, once you're turning and so on. Uh, it is assisted by these five factors. It is assisted by virtue or, you know, uh, living basically by the precepts, you know, abandoning the, the 10 unskillful actions. It has learning, a discussion of the Dhamma, and serenity and insight. Because for most people, very few people come to get the right view and attain the Magha and Pala without having these, doing these, having, being assisted by morality or sila and also learning, gaining understanding, even the intellectual understanding and, uh, and then uh, in meditation, uh, developing Dhamma Vichaya, investigation of Dhamma and having discussions with people, like even these kind of discussions to clarify your, uh, you know, your, any, any questions that you had or, you know, uh, you know, to further that uh, kind of understanding, because this is not easy to understand. You have to always pay wise attention uh, because the Dhamma is something very deep. So the, the, the virtue, the learning, the discussion, and then serenity and insight. That means samatha and vipassana. Uh, and that's how you really get the, uh, you know, the deepest levels of understanding. But without discussing the Dhamma and learning and reading, then uh, it's not likely uh, you're going to, you know, get ready for it. Then, then he asks, uh, again, he asks, uh, Friend, how many kinds of being are there? And we've discussed being before. Uh, that means Baba. Uh, there's three kinds of beings. Sense sphere being, fine material being, and immaterial being. Actually, I just alluded to these uh, just a couple minutes ago when we were talking about this uh, formless jhana. So the sense sphere being means like human beings and animals and in other realms, even realms and people that are in hell or hungry ghosts, they still have senses, you know, some kind of senses, uh, eye, ear, nose, tongue, uh, body, but you know, they might be in different degrees or not all of them, some of them, but they have, it means that you have these, uh, one or another, or all of these five senses, that's called sense sphere being. So animals have those two. And then what is fine material being? This is more difficult to understand. This is a uh, beings born in the, like in the Brahma realms. So people who've attained j only jhana, the first, second, third, and fourth jhana, in the three different degrees, they are born in these sense sphere realms. Or even when you attain jhana, you're no longer in the f regular sense sphere. You're in fine material form. Uh, and if, if you die in a jhana, then you, your mind can be reborn in these sense sphere. <clears throat> and the immaterial being are the people that are reborn in these formless realms that I just mentioned before. So, but all that is based on, on the karma. It's the karma that gets you born in the sense sphere realms. So it's only if you've mastered meditation in the jhanas can you be reborn in the higher realms anyway. So for all intents and purposes, you know, probably 99.9% .9 of beings are uh, probably, you know, born in these, uh, in the lower realms, in the sense sphere uh, realms. <clears throat> so, then he asks, how is the renewal of being in the future generated? I mean, like, how does this rebirth get generated, the being in these places? 
It's through delighting in this and that on the part of beings who are hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. So the average unwise person is hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving. I like that. It's a very nice <laughs> phrase. You know, hindered by ignorance. I mean, it's our ignorance is hindering our ability to understand the Dhamma and to experience, you know, greater levels of freedom. Uh, and fettered by craving. So the fetters, ignorance and, and both ignorance and craving. But see, because of the ignorance, we get we allow ourselves to be fettered by the craving. And how is the renewal of being in the future not generated? Friend, it's with the fading away of ignorance, with the arising of true knowledge and with the cessation of craving, renewal of being in the future is not generated. So, then he goes on to ask about the jhana. Friend, what is the first jhana? And then he gives the standard the description of the first jhana. Well, friend, uh, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a person enters and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture born of rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. This is called the first jhana. And then he asks, how many factors does the first jhana have? And then he, he repeats the, the jhana factors of applied and sustained thought, rapture, pleasure, and one-pointedness of mind. And then he asks, how many factors are abandoned in the first jhana? And how many factors are possessed? So we are, he, he's possessed of those five jhanic factors and he has abandoned the five hindrances. So in order to enter the first jhana, you have to abandon these five states, sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and remorse, and doubt. So those five hindrances have to be suppressed first, aband temporarily abandoned. And because of that arise the jhana factors of applied and sustained thought. That means the mind is, you know, uh, fully focused on the, the meditation subject. And then he asks, Some of these uh, questions are pretty uh, astute and uh, uh, <clears throat> now he goes on to ask about the five faculties again, the sense faculties, okay? The eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. And each cannot experience the other. And the eye cannot experience sound. The eye cannot experience smell, taste, or touch. The ear cannot experience sight. The nose cannot experience sight. So these, can't, these things uh, cannot be interchangeable. But it's consciousness that experiences, uh, can experience each of those. So each of those have the mind as their resort. That's the common thing that it's the, the mind that's able to experience all those different uh, sense, senses. So the ear cannot talk to the eye and, or the skin cannot talk, you know. They all have to go to the, to the brain, you know, to perception. So yeah, you can be smelling and tasting and feeling all, all of this uh, kind of like simultaneously, right? Uh, you know, when you're eating food and you got the sounds going on somewhere and you got feelings in the body, you know, within the space of a second or two, you, you can experience sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, all those five senses, but uh, they're occurring at different moments, mind moments, you know, as we've talked before, this is occurring millions of times in the space of 
a couple of seconds, you, you can have so many different things. But it's the mind that ties them all together. And they, they, uh, and these five faculties, what do they depend on? He's asking these five, what do these five faculties depend on? They depend on vitality. And then he asks, well, what does vitality depend on? Vitality is, depends on heat. And he says, what depends on, what does heat depend on? And he says, heat depends on vitality. And then this is interesting uh, between them. He says, just now, friend, we understood the Venerable Sariputta to have said vitality stands in dependence depends on heat. And now we hear him say heat depends on vitality. So, you know, what's a skinny? You know, how, how, how should we understand this? And he gives a little simile. In that case, friend, I shall give you a simile. Just as when an oil lamp is burning, its radiance is seen in dependence on the flame. So the radiance depends on the flame. And the flame is seen dependent on the radiance. In that way, vitality stands in dependence on heat, and heat stands in dependence on vitality. Then he goes into asking about vital formations, or things that can be felt, or vital formations, one thing that can be felt is another. Uh, so here it's talking about uh, the difference between uh, vital formations and the, uh, the feeling and perception. And he's talking about the monk who can enter into the, what is called the ninth jhana, the, or the cessation of feeling and perception. Uh, And then he asks, when this body lies dead, how many states are discarded and forsaken, left lying like a senseless love? When this body is lying dead, three states, vitality, heat, and consciousness, are discarded. But... That's when one dies, that vitality, heat, and consciousness, uh, you know, leaves the body. But he's asking, what is the difference between one who is dead and one who has entered the state of the cessation of feeling and perception? So the one who has died as verbal formations have ceased bodily formations have ceased, and mental formations have ceased. And the vitality is exhausted and the heat has been dissipated, and faculties are fully broken up. In the case of one who has entered the cessation of perception and feeling, the bodily formations have ceased, verbal formations have ceased, mental formations have ceased, even consciousness, but his vitality is not exhausted and his heat is not dissipated. And his faculties become exceptionally clear. That is the difference between one who is, has died and a person who has entered the state of cessation of feeling and perception. That's why, uh, but only really our haunts and anagamis had the mental power to enter the state of cessation of feeling and perception is considered to be almost a tantamount to the experience in Nibbana, uh, like after death. But so uh, when a person enters this state, he has to warn people, okay, I'm gonna enter this state of feeling and perception. I'm not dead. Because an ordinary, a doctor would say this person's dead. 
you know, they might take him to the morgue. That's why they wake up later, you know, because it doesn't happen here. But, you know, th maybe that is the, could be the case you've heard about. People were, you know, being pronounced dead and they, they wake up, you know, maybe they were in the state of feeling and uh, neurota samapati. Probably not because I doubt if they were the kind of people were arahants who had that kind of power. But nevertheless, it's just showing that there is this state available, that you would appear to be dead for all intents and purposes to a doctor. And this person's dead. And, you know, and then they wake up a few hours later. What? Uh, and then he goes on to ask some uh, questions about the deliverance of the mind, but uh, uh, it's kind of really uh, talks about the signless element or the neither painful, the deliverances of the mind basically are like attaining the jhanas and attaining the, uh, especially the, uh, like the formless, I mean the, uh, uh, the, the four jhanas are the, called the deliverances of the mind, especially the fourth jhana which has neither pain nor pleasure. And uh, the signless deliverance of the mind, which is, uh, which is the non-attention to all signs and attention to the signless element. Uh, so these are quite, you know, different, uh, difficult to understand. Uh, but they're talking about, you know, inner basically the experience in the immeasurable deliverances of the mind uh, through like nothingness, the formless jhanas, through voidness and through insight and the, the attainment of Nibbana. So these, uh, these kind of formless and signless states are the experience of, of Nibbana because there's no signs in the consciousness of anything. Uh, it's difficult to describe. So, basically, you know, this is referring to those uh, immeasurable deliverances of the mind. Uh, and then this last, uh, <clears throat> what is the deliverance of mind through voidness? Here a monk goes to the forest or the root of a tree and he reflects, this is void of a self or what belongs to a self. This is called the deliverance of mind through voidness. It basically means the emptiness of the self is the true meaning of the voidness. In fact, uh, in one of the later uh, sutta classes, I'm going to be talking about the Chula Sunyata Sutta and the Maha Sunyata Sutta, the lesser discourse on voidness and the greater discourse on voidness. Um, and these are also called the measure, uh, the, the measureless the states of mind. And then he talks about lust is a maker of measurement. Hate is a maker of measurement. Delusion is a maker of measurement. So for one whose uh, taints are destroyed, who has destroyed all the, uh, you know, greed, hatred, and delusion, not subject to future arising, that's why they're immeasurable, because they're, they're free from uh, greed, hatred, and delusion. And all the various types of signs that do, would differentiate something uh, from another thing. Uh, anyway, you can read the rest of the sutra if you have that copy. So that was the end of these particular questions in the uh, Maha Vedala Sutta. Uh, 
Now there's also a Chula Vedala Sutta that uh, maybe we'll we'll also look at that Sutta maybe uh, next week, seeing how it's uh, maybe should have done that one first. <laughs> it would have been easier to understand, I think, uh, than uh, that one. But does anybody uh, so does anybody have any questions uh, uh, based on that, uh, that Sutta? Let me see if there's. Uh, Says, because both of these monks were arhats and have direct knowledge, why would they need to discuss it in this way? Is it so that the listening monks, whoever we said this, can learn? Thank you. Uh, no, they come together because there's nothing else for them to talk about, and they like to they like to to, to press the others to see. Uh, their replies, I and mean, they, they get joy out of, you know, here people want to talk about politics, or they want to talk about so many other things that, you know, stimulate your greed, hatred, and delusion, but Arahans want to talk only about wisdom, and it, it, it makes them happy when, when they realize the depth of somebody, uh, somebody else could, you know, Sariputta was, you know, a captain of the Dhamma, right, and so, you know, he is very wise, and so when others, he hear how others can explain the Dhamma in their own unique ways, he, you know, it makes him happy. And they, they get joy out of discussing the Dhamma. That way they could sit up and discuss the Dhamma the whole night long because it, it brings happiness because the Dhamma is, that's what it stated. It's free from greed, hatred, and delusion, and it opens up uh, the wisdom mind. So... But yeah, maybe there were other monks around listening to that, you know, wanted to, oh, these guys, are, you know, these two great monks are going to have a discussion, you know, and so, yeah, they want to go and listen too. So whenever the Buddha gave discourses, you know, so many people would come to listen because, uh, you know, they wanted to learn. Uh, What is the difference between the mental formations and consciousness? Mental formations are objects of our consciousness. So mental formation would be an angry thought in your mind, right? Okay, you cognize that. The mind is angry. That's why you can say, ah, oh, the mind is angry now. You can kind of look at it. It's the looking consciousness, that's the consciousness. You know, it, it, it can observe things with detachment. Normally not very much detachment for most people, but with the training, it kind of pulls back. So, you know, you, the mental formations are any urge, you, let's say urge to scratch, you know, wanting any thought, they're all mental for me. Every, anything that the mind does is a mental formation, basically. Uh, even consciousness, you could say, is a mental formation but in a different sense. But so uh, that's the difference between, uh, and also form, feeling, perception, and uh, volition or mental uh, volition, uh, men mental activities. These, all of these four aggregates are the object of the consciousness. So we can observe a form. We can say, ah, this is form, <coughs> feeling, perception, because we can, Observe them. The consciousness is sort of separate from, from them in a way, or you can, you can, you can pull away from it a little bit. That's what is called the mindfulness. You know, the mindfulness is that function that helps to create a kind of a, a space before one would react with something. Uh, what is a sign as mentioned in the last two sections of the sutta? The sadness, emotions, mental formations. Yeah, the sign is anything that distinguishes something from something else, that marks something else. That's the way we can differentiate things. 
is the you know th this face has a different sign than the head of the Buddha or the lion there. Uh, yeah, so it's perceptions that that are create the signs because the, and uh, the sign of pain and pleasure because it has different you know reactions to it. So the signless state of consciousness is when there, there's no signs. That means the mind is not creating any kind of distinctions. And all distinctions are come from greed, hatred, and delusion. And so when greed, hatred, and delusion are subsided or you know, overcome, or even attaining jhanas, you're no longer creating any signs. There's just those jhanic factors of pleasure and rapture and pleasure, one-pointedness and so on. Those are also some kind of signs, but very minimal. So this, uh, last question. Uh, I'm trying to put these terms in proper relationships. Wisdom, mind, five aggregates. Is mind a different entity from others? No, the five aggregates is the mind. Uh, <laughs> I mean, feeling, perception, volition, and conscious, four aggregates. It's called uh, Nama Kanda. So uh, the mind, the mind isn't a thing, uh, kind of just a one static thing. But consciousness is the, the, the predominant feature of the mind, but without form and feeling, perception of volition, consciousness would just be a light sitting here, not doing anything, just a light. And it would have no meaning. Nothing, go, everything, anything going through it, there would be no meaning, no reaction. All that's done by form, feeling, perception, volition, and the consciousness. So it's the feeling, feeling is considered the first aspect of the mind. When you, you get, Prick, the first thing you cognize is, is a feeling, is, and then you perceive it. As we read in the, in the sutra, it said, what you feel, you perceive. And what you perceive, you think about, the, the, vol the vol volition. And then you're, you're conscious of that. So without feeling, perception, and volition, the, the mind would be basically useless. I mean, in terms of doing anything in life, right? And without, without consciousness, you wouldn't be conscious. So you wouldn't even know about feeling, perception, and volition. So altogether, those four, form, feeling, perception, and consciousness, together make the conditioned mind, what we call the conditioned mind. We're not talking about, you know, what people might call cosmic awareness or cosmic mind or something else, or big mind, okay? Uh, people use these terms in different ways, but for all intents and purposes, for anybody who's not enlightened, the mind is the process of feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness. Now you can, as we've already understood, you can separate consciousness from feeling, perception, but only if you've attained inibbana or the state of Nirodha Samapati, totally. You can disconnect to certain degrees, even when you attain jhana, you are limiting the amount of perceptions and feelings that you're getting. You know, and you gradually eliminate them little by little until you reach that state of the cessation of feeling and perception, uh, which it said is like you're, you're a dead man. Uh, because there's no feeling or perception. So it's really, that's what makes us alive is feeling and perception. But the consciousness is also there, but consciousness can exist, you know, sort of without feeling and perception, but only for somebody who's attained this the very highest levels of concentration. Okay, uh, so is wisdom apart from mind? Uh, well, again, you know, these questions are not that easy to, uh, uh, even that was one of the questions, I think. Wisdom 
apart from consciousness. Yes, you can be conscious and you can have the mind without wisdom, but you can't have wisdom without the mind. So, uh, you know. Yes, we develop wisdom based on the aggregates. That's how we develop wisdom by contemplating the impermanence of sound, smell, taste, touch, you know, the process of impermanence in the aggregate. So we develop wisdom based on the, the aggregates. Uh, would partially develop wisdom carry from one life to the next? Yes, of course. That's, that's how a Sotapanna can advance to, to a once returning. And a once returning can advance to never returning because these uh, stages get carried over. You know, it could take several lifetimes to go through those four levels. But yes, that is uh, carried on. Yeah, but even mundane knowledge is carried on. What you learn in this lifetime is going to have some effect, determine what your next life is going to be, even in a mundane connection, even if you hadn't attained, let's say, stream entry or something. Okay, so again, you know, all these questions it takes. It is only, you know, these questions are only going to be fully understood as you develop, you know, deeper and deeper levels of mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom through your meditation practice. And that's only going to improve if you, again, you develop this, have the assisted by the morality, the, the virtue, learning, having discussions like this, asking questions, and getting your doubts removed. And, and then of course, serenity and insight, which is the meditation practice. Okay, friends, so uh, uh, that uh, we're going to finish this part of the program uh, now. And uh, like, since how it came up, I was going to do another sutra, but perhaps next week we'll do the Chula Vedala Sutra, just so that there's a continuity. Uh, there are number 44, but I'll send out a, a, an announcement about that. Uh, and, uh, it's an interesting uh, conversation between a lay person and a nun, actually. So, uh, <clears throat> okay, so let's take a little break to use the restroom, uh, have a drink of water. We'll come back, do a few stretches, and then have our meditation. Okay.
Hey friends, we're uh, now do a few stretches before having our meditation. <clears throat> Find a place to stand a bit. Again, the reason why we do the yoga <clears throat> exercises before meditation is to hopefully have more feeling, you know, in the body and help to initially get the the mind grounded and centered in the body, feeling more sensations because that would help you to stay, you know, concentrated and So, first of all, just feel the feet pressing the floor. Just relax the shoulders, feel the weight of the arms and hands hanging at the side. And feel your clothing touching the skin on different places. Just gently close your eyes. Feel the head balanced on top of the neck. And then begin some deep, slow breathing. Try to take three or four seconds or more to slowly breathe in. Hold the air in the lungs for two or three or four seconds. Allow the oxygen to get into the blood, to carry it out to the body and feel the relaxing contractions of the out breath. We coordinate these movements with the breathing. So in the next in breath, raise the arms over the head, interlock the fingers. Turn the palms up, straighten the arms. Stretch the head back and arch your back and spine a little bit. And stretch upwards all at the same time. On the out breath, turn the palms down, touch the top of your head. Just feel those sensations. Again, in breath, palms up, straighten the arms. Arch backward. Out breath, touch the top of the head. Third time, hold that upward stretch longer. Release the fingers on the out breath, arms back to the sides. Close the eyes, relax, feel the effects of that in the body, especially in the hands and fingers, sort of feel that increased pulsation, tingling sensation. So just any other sensations that you might feel in the body. Try to feel where your clothing touches the skin. And just remember the present moment of standing. 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 Just letting your thoughts come and go in the back of the mind. Just keep the feeling of the body in the front of the awareness. Okay, then the next exercise on the in-breath, push up on the toes, or raising the arms over the head in this way, face the palms toward each other about six inches apart and stretch. The out breath, come back down, arms to the side, heels back down to the floor. 
use the breath to help lift and lower the body. In breath, blowing up a helium balloon, the body rises up. Out. in stretch out relax and just feel the body sensation So many different body sensations you can notice. It's the feeling that feels them. It's feeling in consciousness. Next, we'll do side bending. On the in breath, raise both arms up in this way. You keep the hands and arms straight, the fingers and arms straight. On the out breath, bend over the right side as far as you comfortably can. You keep the arms, hands parallel to each other. In breath, lift up. And the out breath, the other side. In breath, up. Out breath, again to the right. In breath, out breath, lift. Once more to each side. On the out breath, lower both arms. Just relax. Gently close the eyes. <clears throat> Feel all those sensations. Just move to the vitality, the heat. Remember standing, standing, standing. And then the last exercise, the head turning. On the in-breath, turn the head to the right. Try to look over your right shoulder. Also turn the eyes to the right. Focus on some spot to the right. On the out breath, turn 180 degrees back to the left. Look over the left shoulder. If you have a stiff neck, just be careful. Turn the eyes to the left. In breath, back to the right. Let's concentrate into the neck vertebrae. Imagine you feel them loosening up. Out breath, lift.
once more to each side. In breath, right? Out breath, left. On the next in breath, let the head stop in the center. Just feel the whole body, feet pressing the floor, the arms and hands at the sides, clothing touching the skin on different places. The head balanced on top. Remember standing, standing, the perception of the mind from the memory knows the body is standing. Okay, let's come back to prepare for the sitting meditation. So again, I'm going to turn off uh, my video so that hopefully you'll keep your mind focused inside your own body and mind not be tempted to look out what I'm doing. Just pay attention to the, to the meditation. Okay, so try to sit straight. Adjust your, place your hands someplace comfortable, either one on top of the other in your lap or resting on your legs. If you're sitting in a chair, try to keep the feet flat on the floor. Try to keep the back straight back and the head in a straight line. Try not to lean back on the back of a chair. <clears throat> and gently close the eyes. First of all, just feel the weight of the buttocks pressing the seat. Feel that contact, solid contact call the earth element vibration. So I feel some sensations in your buttock. The left one, the right one. Now feel your feet and toes pressing the floor. And try to feel your left foot or right foot. And feel different toes. It's keeping the mind and the body. Now feel your hands and fingers. You feel the subtle pulsations or tingling, 
sensations in your hands, where they touch together. And then gently kind of stretch the spine upwards. Imagine the spinal column, you know, the space between the spinal vertebrae. And feel the head balanced on top of the spinal column. You keep your chin level parallel to the floor. Just feel your face, different sensations on your face. Just feel your lips touching together. And feel inside the mouth, feel your tongue, the teeth, the gums. You might feel saliva. And the earth element, saliva being the water element. Water vibration. Then take a few deep, slow breaths to feel the air moving through the nostrils. If you take a deep enough breath, you, also, you might hear the sound of the air moving through the nostrils. Knowing that this body lives on the oxygen and the life force being brought in with the breathing. Hold the air in the lungs a few seconds just to feel those sensations of that pause between the breaths. And feel the relaxing out breath. Now feel your eyes resting in the sockets and the eyelids stretched over the eyeball. Kind of just sort of gaze around the eyeballs, the inner gaze. You might see some light or color patterns. Feel the blood pulsing in the eye capillary. Now from that point behind the eyes, just try to let the awareness kind of open up a bit to feel the outline of the sitting body, kind of in one gaze, just sort of feeling the feet pressing the floor, the hands touching in the center. Where the clothing touches the skin on different places, and the head balanced on top. Kind of should be able to just feel all those different sensations. 
within that field of consciousness, sitting body consciousness, the perception of sitting. Because of all those sensations of your feet, hands, legs, clothing, touching the skin and head, And the memory of the mind creates the perception of sitting body. Just try to hold that perception of the sitting posture in the mind's eye. And then again, take some deep, slow breaths, really charge up the body-mind system with oxygenated blood, vitality. And hold the air in the lungs a few seconds to feel that pause. You just take some long breaths. Just breathing in a long breath, one nose. One breathe in a long breath. Breathing out a long breath, one nose. Just breathing out a long breath. Feel all those different sensations of the expanding in breath and the pause and the contracting out breath and the pause. We're going to try to count the breaths from one to ten during that same deep, slow breathing, if you can maintain that. Count the breaths from one to ten to try to gain a better concentration. So just keep the attention focused on either the whole body or just the sensations of breathing. With the next expanding in breath, mentally count one. Feel the pause. With the contracting out breath, also count one. The next expanding in breath, two. The contracting out breath, two. In breath three. Out breath three. In breath four. Out breath four. In breath five. Out breath five. In breath six. Out breath six. In 
in breath seven. Out breath seven. In breath eight. Out breath eight. In breath nine. Out breath nine. In breath ten. Out breath ten now discontinue the counting discontinue the deep slow breathing controlling the breath let the breathing return to the shorter breaths of the uncontrolled normal breathing but continue to feel it Keep your attention and focus there in the center of the body, feeling the subtler movements of expanding and contracting. So if you were the light touch of the clothing rubbing against the skin of the stomach or the rib cage or the chest as it expands and contracts, just make that the knowing point of the breathing, knowing when the breath is coming in, and knowing when the breath is going out. So the perception, the feeling, and the consciousness are all there. You feel the sensations, you perceive them as breathing. Consciousness knows it. This breathing in the shorter breaths. One knows there are shorter breaths. Breathing out to shorter breaths. Try to notice how each breath is different. Sometimes longer or shorter. Sometimes you feel it more in the abdomen, sometimes you feel it in the chest for the rib cage. It's always changing. Just cultivate that connection to the present moment of the breathing body. In, in, sitting, out, out, sitting. Just simply breathing in, sitting, breathing out, sitting. Remembering the present moment, the perception and consciousness together. 
consciousness is simply the space, the knowing space, the labels of breathing in, the breathing out, the idea of it, feeling of it is the perception, feeling and the perception and the consciousness. Even the material aggregate is there, the sensation. Any mental activity. Within, within each in breath, all five aggregates are there. With each out breath, all five aggregates are there. The sensation, the feeling, the perception, the thought, or the desire. The desire to live, to breathe. Consciousness. So breathing in, sitting. Breathing out, sitting. It's the ongoing, continuous connection to the present moment. The breathing body is this natural connection to the present moment awareness. Breathing body is a connection to the world. Even while feeling the breathing, you can notice the thoughts or urges moving to the back of the mind. You can urge to move with the mental activity or just random thoughts trying to sneak in. Recognize a thought is the muscle, perception, mental activity, consciousness. Just let the thoughts come and go in the back of the mind. Keep that connection to the breathing body in the front of the awareness. Especially with each out breath, allow the body and mind to relax more and more into the present moment, to the here and now. You might hear some sounds in your house coming and going in the background. The sound of this voice is also just hearing perception. Even 
while feeling the breathing, other sensations on the body may take your attention like some itches or pain. And just to see them arising in the background. If the mind starts to go toward them, kind of back off, just note uh, sensation, sensation. Pain, pain, it's just a feeling. See how quickly they change and disappear. The mind gains more focus, more calm, start to notice subtler and finer details, sensations, coming and going, the breathing body. It's gradually opening up to the flow of impermanent so many different sensations arising and vanishing in the body. Thoughts moving to the back of the mind. I try to identify the five aggregates of this is material form, any kind of vibration, this is feeling, pleasant, painful, or neutral feeling, this is perception, recognition of an object, mental volition, any urges or thoughts about it. And the consciousness itself, which is just the light, the space of awareness. The sense of I, ego. Be alert for any urges, the urge to move the body, urge to do something else, urge to think, it's the mental volition. You perceive that, perception perceives the mental volition, You're conscious of that.
If you catch yourself totally lost in thought, recognize it as lost, lost. Find the body sitting on the floor, take a few deep breaths. Bring the mind back into the body, coming back to this. Breathing in, sitting. Breathing out, sitting. Get re-centered back in awareness. helps you to concentrate, you can be counting the breaths again from one to ten by yourself. Stay alert, awake, moment by moment, breath by breath. Keeping up with the flow of impermanence from moment to moment. So be alert for when any painful feelings and pleasant sensations pull the mind. Relax around any painful sensations, relax the body, relax the mind. So let those sensations just ricochet around, see how they're impermanent, build up to a peak, diminish, often disappear shortly. Or even a 
they can the less be aware of other sensations without getting stuck on the pain. You can also contemplate the Four Noble Truths. You have a lot of thinking you can think about. This is suffering, the cause of suffering, the ending of suffering, the path leading to the ending of suffering. It's a wonderful contemplation in itself. Become the wise person in the Dhamma.
what perception arises with this sound. And feeling, mental volition. Sabe Sankara Anichati Yada Panyaya Pasati Atene Bindati Dukini Esa Mago Visudhiya All conditioned things, the five aggregates of this body, mind, and world are impermanent. When one sees this with the eye of wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with suffering. This is the path to purity, to freedom. And thus spoke the Buddha. You know, friends, as we normally do, I want to finish the meditation sending out thought, feeling, vibrations of metta or friendliness and best wishes for our own body and mind and for others. So again, so we combine that with some deep, slow breathing. It takes a few deep, slow breaths. And after breathing in, hold the air in the lungs as long as you comfortably can. Feel or imagine that oxygenated blood going out to all the cells and tissues of the body, being like metta calming and soothing them, feeling that relaxing, healing sensation on the out breath. And just take several deep, slow breaths like that again, just imagine that oxygen, saturated blood being metta to your cells, sending metta friendliness to your cells, body and mind, and relaxation on the out breath making your mind peaceful. Just with the thought that may I be well, peaceful and wise. May I be free from excessive attachment and greed, anger or hatred, jealousy, envy, fear, pride and ignorance. May I be free from the pain, sorrow, and sufferings brought about by such unskillful thought, speech, and actions. May I also have the patience, strength, mindfulness, and wisdom to meet and overcome all difficulties in life. May I be able to continue to practice the Dhamma and deepen the wisdom, the practice of meditation, to free the mind from confusion and suffering. May I be well, peaceful, and wise. So if you can, continue to take some deep, slow breaths. And after breathing in, holding in the breath, just imagine that that energy radiating out of your body and mind, those meta vibrations of friendliness, best wishes, sending them outward to your family members. And if you have any friends or family members who are suffering or ill in any way, send some extra bit of meta vibrations to them. Also, you can remember Prashant and his mother who are undergoing this difficult 
times adjusting to the hospice and preparing for the eventual reality of leaving this world, leaving the, the body behind for his mother. And with each out breath, just imagine these vibrations going further and further out across the countryside through the cities and across the oceans to encompass the whole world and beyond. Just with the idea that may all living beings be well, peaceful and wise. May all beings have the patience, strength, mindfulness, and wisdom to meet and overcome all difficulties in life. May all beings be able to hear the Dhamma, practice the Dhamma, and meditation to help free their minds from confusion and suffering. May all beings be well, peaceful, and wise. May all beings in the whole world be well, peaceful, and wise. Just like a mantra reverberating throughout space. Well, peaceful and You know, we can, those who like to join in chanting the sadhu three times, we can do that with deep breathing on a long out breath, chanting the tone sadhu, we breathe in. So. the hands at the edge of the knees. Now the next in breath, stretch the head back and pull the hands against the knees, and arch the lower spine, hold it a few moments. Now in breath, lift the head up. And on an out breath, press the chin to the top of the chest to stretch the neck vertebrae. And lift the chin up level on the in breath. On the out breath, put a smile on your face. Okay, friends. So, brings our evening together uh, over. And uh, I mentioned next week, we'll go with the Chula Vedala Sutra, it's the number 
144, I think, in the Majjhima Nikaya, but I'll send out a reminder about that. So, uh, wish you all a good week and hope you all can continue your daily meditations, MMs. Thank you, Bhante. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Bhante. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Nisanka, I'll, yes. uh, we'll try to talk in a day or two about uh, uh, that uh, retreat in February. You know. Because the people in Brazil, they also want me to do a, a weekend retreat over Zoom. But it would probably be on the weekend of the 20th of uh, February. Okay. I think the, the one with your group may be in the first part of February, right? Or we can discuss that. It's usually, yeah, we'll discuss it. Yes. Yeah. Because they need a translation. I was, I was going to actually... Uh, suggest that we combine the two, but then I realized they, they're they going to have to use a translator. So that uh, may not be uh, suitable for yes. uh, non-Portuguese. <laughs> We're not speaking English, but you know, the, you know, having a translator. So we'll do a separate one anyway. And, uh, and then I'll mention to anybody on this program or even on my website, if anybody also wants to join that, uh, that retreat, you know, in February, for the OBA, it would be, I guess it'd be okay for anybody to also yes. participate, right? Yes, I think so. Yeah. I'll try to find out about that, yeah. yeah. I may at some point also do some, just some, like a DOM on the Zoom here uh, uh, sometime in after maybe a couple more weeks or so. But we'll see. It's all a, okay. it's all a work in progress. Okay? Okay, thank you. Well, Bob, how are you, Bob, Ilam? I'm very well, sir. How are you? Oh. Uh, Keep them going, all right? Yeah. Interesting times, aren't they? I, yes. It, it really highlights impermanence on a hour by hour basis. You know, it's just, and, and you were just talking about retreats. Bonte, I told my group I would ask you, it's been two or three months back now, but we do a Tuesday night set. Would you be available to maybe do a talk, a little Q and A on a Tuesday night, sometime between a, a seven and nine type framework? We do a med meditation from seven to 7.40. And then usually it's like, you know, 7.45 to 9, something like that. And you don't uh, have Yeah, I can, I can probably do that. Okay. Yeah, we'll send me an email. We'll discuss it over email, okay? That sounds great. I look forward to reading the next Suda. I think I will do that tonight. Okay. Uh, I was the one with the sign questions. I'd like to talk to you more about it at a future point. Yeah, sure. okay. Thank you, Monty. Have a wonderful week. Yeah, you too. Namo Buddhaya. Thank you. I'm going to be signing off now. So, Bonte Judy says hello as well. Oh, <laughs> tell her hi for me. I will. Was she listening to? No, but she knew I was coming on the on the set tonight. She said, "If she, if you know, if you can, let Bonte know." I said, "Hello." Okay. Try to give, get her to sit, but, Give her my blessings and greetings. But, but we are sitting together each day for like 30 minutes or so. Oh, that's very. So good. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>